So, okay, uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Sandrine, Roderick, and uh, Stephen for inviting me. It's always a treat for me to come back to Bay Area. And um, yesterday we heard uh, many excellent talks on single cell RNA seq and attack seq. And uh, as you can imagine, as these technologies are becoming mature, um, you know, we are improving, we are developing technology to do these experiments that have, we have done in um, bulk cells uh, with single cells. So uh, chromatin conformation capture experiments is one such type of uh, experimental protocols uh, where we are looking at um, 3D confirmation of single cells. So my talk is largely uh, basically divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm gonna talk about our normalization and denoising efforts. And then in the second part, I'm gonna talk about our efforts in integrating this type of data with other, um, with other data, single cell data modalities. So for this audience, uh, most of this is probably familiar, but just to make sure we are all on the same page, um, I'll just go through. The basics, so if you think about the linear structure of the DNA, we have genes, uh, proximal promoter regions, distal enhancer regions, and activities of this, the genes are uh, regulated by interactions between enhancers and promoters. So in the last 10 years or so, we have generated catalogs of these regulatory elements, and then we have now a large scale efforts in uh, generating uh, long range interactions. And uh, so the looping of the DNA the um, compression of the DNA in the, in the cell uh, and the 3D structure is what brings uh, promoters and enhancers together to facilitate gene regulation. And uh, we, for the last 10 years or so, we have had uh, technologies, high throughput technologies that can profile these interactions. So these technologies, uh, there are many types, but they, they basically work by generating fragments that come from both ends of these interacting regions. And then with paired and uh, sequencing, you get one read coming from this fragment and then one read coming from this fragment. And then we align these. Um, we typically, these bulk assays generate millions to billions of reads. We align these um, and then uh, for the sake of uh, you know, summarizing the data, we generate artificial bins on the genome and we count the you know, read pairs spanning, falling into uh, bin pairs. Um, I'll be referring to these as locus pairs. And then we, you know, we quantify the number of interactions we see between these locus pairs. And then we represent this as what we typically refer to by uh, contact matrices. Um, so, of course, with the improvements in single cell sequencing for the last uh, 10 years or so, again, on and off, there has been efforts in uh, generating this type of data, profiling these type of interactions at the single cell level. So um, we have early uh, papers from 2013 with small number of cells, and the, but in the last few years, these efforts have been really scaled up. Um, and. Uh, so just like any other data, uh, high throughput data coming from uh, a particular technology, uh, single cell high c has its own uh, unique features. Some of these are very similar to what we observe in RNA-seq. So this is what a typical bulk high c data might look like. And we have you know, heard about sparsity. We know about sparsity in single cell sequencing. So not so surprisingly, we see, that we see it in a single cell high c as well. Uh, you know, high depth um, contact count matrix might look like this, where you are, you know, getting the broad structures, but you have much more sparsity compared to the bulk. And if you go to a lower depth uh, single cell high C a contact matrix, then you might get something that looks much, much uh, sparser. So the point is that, yes, this data is sparse, just like single cell RNA seq, but the sparsity level is a uh, much more larger uh, uh, because we are looking at uh, a larger space of the genome. And then, you know, this, some of the sparsity is true because some regions of the region, some regions of the genome don't interact with each other. Um, and another typical data characteristic is uh, what we call the genomic distance effect. As you can imagine, genes that are uh, regions on the genome that are nearby each other are just likely to interact more by chance. So this is known as the, um, genomic distance effect, and it's usually visualized by, pro, uh, by uh, quantifying the interaction frequency between genomic loci as a function of the genomic distance between them. So this is what it looks like in bulk. Um, 
And uh, we naturally, we looked at this uh, in the uh, single cell world. Uh, I have two cell types here, and then the cells are generate, cells are separated depending on their, uh, their sequencing depth. And then each line represents a, a single cell and the color depicts this, you know, the library size or the sequencing depth of the cell. And as you can see, we also see the genomic distance effect, but perhaps it's affected both by the library size and actually the genomic distance, and then maybe an interaction between those. So, so this is like one of the typical exploratory plots we would do. And then to further motivate our modeling, we actually fit a mixed effects model um, to this data where we allowed variation, uh, cell-specific variation, and then ask whether you know, we can capture the interaction frequency between genomic loci with cell type, library size, band, which, which is a, a proxy for the genomic distance and the interaction between them. So we considered as, you know, a large set of models and uh, in all the models, uh, including an interaction between the library size and the band really helped. So this is something to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, so with these observations in mind, we, we, we said we'll start with something super simple. So that's one end of the spectrum in terms of normalizing this data. And then we'll do something fancy, you know, adapting things from uh, deep generative modeling for single cell data. So uh, towards this, we developed band norm and SCBI 3B. Um, both of these operate by uh, working on this, what we call band transformation, where we essentially uh, take genomic loci that are equidistant uh, from each other and then organize them in these uh, locus pair by cell matrices. So we would take all the purple bands from these contact matrices, organize them like this, and then take the next band and so on and so forth. And then band norm is a super simple. Uh, it basically, uh, within each band, it adjusts for the library size uh, of the cells uh, within the band matrix and then across the band matrices. And then on top of that, to allow, um, the effect that you know perhaps this band decay is something that can vary from cell to cell. It add, adds back a band decay estimate that's essentially an average of these band matrices. So it's really not doing anything specific. It's scaling and then adding band the band decay uh, to allow that perhaps some cell specific band decay and also perhaps give a little bit more weight to the interactions that are more close to each other. And then, so that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, we actually took SCVI. Um, we heard a lot. Uh, we heard a lot of mention of SCVI yesterday, and then we modified it uh, for our purposes. Uh, so we can do this because we have seen that uh, these uh, um, interactions that we see at locus pairs are modulated by both library size and the band. So for each band matrix, we assume that local specific counts come from a Poisson um, comma mixture model, where we have a, a local specific rate parameter, which is modulated by the cell and uh, library size. Uh, and then this modulating parameter is coming from a log normal distribution. And we also made the uh, zero inflation probability local specific because some of the zeros are going to be <clears throat> just because you know they are coming from heterochromatin regions and so on and so forth and then um, just going basically over it then we assume that these key parameters of the parametric models uh, are actually non-linear functions of these latent variables uh, that capture uh, cells characteristics so we made um, so we make this uh, probability of zero inflation and the shape parameter of the gamma distribution for the mean rate parameter depend on nonlinear functions of these latent variables that are cell and band specific. And then finally, uh, the, um, these latent variables are coming from Gaussian distributions. So if you, if you know SCVI, so this is actually just one of the models of SCVI applied at the band level. Okay, so for us, this was important to realize and then also justifies with the band and library size interaction because then we can fit this model with SCVI tools. So um, <clears throat> I'll just some, show you some examples of how these work in practice. 
I'll compare this with a number of different methods. Uh, so there's now quite a bit of activity in structuring model, structured modeling of uh, single cell high C data. SEIC cluster is uh, one of the earlier models. It does some linear smoothing and random walk to impute. SEIC topics is a topics model. Um, and Higashi is a really innovator hypergraph model from Jian's lab. And then uh, we have SCVI 3D. And in addition to this, you know, we have band norm that sequencing that normalizes and adds back band decay. We considered even dump alternatives where we are just adjusting for library size and then adjusting for library size in a band aware manner, but then not adding back the decay constant. Okay. And then these all generate, oh, and then one final thing is, you know, none of these scaling approaches take into account the matrix structure of the data. So then we said, okay, let's add maybe some graph convolutional network there to see whether that would make a difference. And then as output, these methods um, either provide low dimensional embeddings and denoise data or just normalized or denoise data. So there are a lot of details in terms of fitting these models, how the cells are filtering. So we try to unify all of those. Uh, and then our manuscript has all the details. Um, and in terms of evaluation, uh, so the one basic evaluation we can do is, you know, given a single cell high C data set where we know the cell types, we can try to see after, you know, normalization and denoising, can we capture the known cell types? And then we can also evaluate all sorts of impact of denoising and normalization on the downstream um, on the downstream analysis. So I'll show you uh, examples of these two and the, all of these other uh, evaluations are in our manuscript. Um, so, so I'll start with this data set, which is uh, basically just profiling uh, a bunch of cell lines. You know, we have, uh, different number of cells for different cell lines. IMR, we have very small number of cells for IMR90, which kind of plays the role of a rare cell type. And then as we can see, so all of the methods, you maps of all of the methods are, low dimensional embeddings are uh, depicted here. Uh, so all the methods have, you know, problem with this IMR90, which has, you know, like very small number of cells. And then in terms of the methods that work on just based on scaling, band norm uh, does better than the others. And actually it works as well as other uh, more structured modeling approaches. And then this is another data set, again, looking at the cell types where now you have two of the cell lines at very, very low number of cells. And then norm SC high cluster and then uh, cell scale coupled with CNN and SCVI 3D, they actually recapitulate three of the uh, cell lines. Okay? And then the other cell line gets mixed up because again, it has two few representation, whereas these other methods can only capitulate the two cell lines. So now this is more like a real example where now we are looking at, uh, uh, we are looking at, um, some mouse brain, we are looking at a human data from human prefrontal cortex, which is much more complicated. And uh, the original publication, this is, this is data from uh, Joe Ecker's lab, uh, indicated that, you know, it was very hard to separate excitatory neuronal subtypes and inhibitor subtypes just based on single cell high C. Uh, but we actually can see that uh, a subset of the methods do actually a pretty good job in separating these two big group of excitatory and inhibitory subtypes. And furthermore, uh, so uh, all of these were at one megabase resolution, so which is perhaps not that useful in terms of learning regulatory interactions, but certainly useful in terms of learning uh, TAD boundaries and so on. So we said, okay, could we push the limit to uh, 100 KB, and then when we do that, methods that have intrinsic imputation, uh, Higashi, SCIC cluster, and SCVI 3D still preserve their performances, but then norm, which was our, you know, really simple, uh, simplistic method, it, it starts to suffer because this now becomes too sparse for it to handle. And then we evaluated these methods uh, on, you know, these four big data sets, and also with different type of metrics. 
And there's one data set from Bing Rand's group. Um, it has small number of cells and probably some confounding issues. Uh, but despite that band norm, which, which is not doing anything fancy, it appeared to perform the best on that. Um, and then if we, you know, if we want to aggregate all these evaluations, we see that band norm performs the best, followed by uh, Higashi and SCBI 3D. And one thing about band norm is that we think of it as, you know, like the initial method you might want to apply to check data quality because it, you know, it runs in 15 minutes, literally, it's like no cost. Whereas these methods, if you have GPU, large cores, they can run within an hour, uh, but you know, they require um, uh, better hardware. Um, so then I'll refer you to these, um, our, our paper for this additional analysis. Oh, actually, actually, okay. So actually, I'm. Let's see. I want to also show uh, how the uh, after denoising how the aggregated single cell matrices compare with the bulkified high C data. So you know, after we normalize and denoise, we can aggregate the um, single cell high C data and then co compare it with the you know um, bulkified with the with the actual bulk high C data. Um, so we have done that for again many different data sets. So I'm showing an example for an abundant cell type um, in, this, in this particular data set. And we can see that uh, here, the upper triangle is the actual bulk IC data coming from a different experiment, different source. And then the lower triangle is the aggregated or pseudo bulk coming from denoise and normalized IC data. So we see that maybe Higashi is a little bit of over imputation, but overall the methods look pretty decent. Uh, in terms of capturing the um, bulk IC. However, if we go to a rare cell type, uh, again, band norm has a lot of sparsity issues uh, and uh, SC high C is maybe, cluster is maybe a little blurry and Higashi, again, we think it has a little bit of a over smoothing issues and uh, SCVI 3D performs, uh, well, it visually looks just right. <laughs> That's one way to put it. And then we compared the, um, bulkified pseudo to bulk. Uh, and then we see that overall band norm seems the best uh, and it's comparable to SCVI 3D. And then as the um, Higashi, shows, Higashi shows quite a bit of variability across the chromosome. So here each data point is a chromosome uh, a score that compares bulkified and the bulk version at the particular chromosome. And as the, um, as the cell type gets rare, then band norm also starts to perform similar to the others. Now I can um, start a little late, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm particularly excited about now our potential uh, to integrate HCIC data with other single cell modalities, especially you know, for you know, tissue, tissue samples. Uh, we can see that you know, identifying sub cell types could be tricky. Um, so we naturally first wanted to integrate this with single cell RNA-seq because there's just so many of that. And uh, again, we want to improve cell type annotation and then also maybe an, uh, understand uh, long range interactions between genes and enhancers. Uh, and uh, so in order to do this, uh, we, so we, our first step at this was, you know, take this uh, SCIC uh, data, which is now here vectorized, we have the locus pairs. And this locus pair representation is good for different type of downstream analysis. But in our first step, we said, okay, maybe there's a way to uh, summarize a CIC data at the level of genes. So we considered a bunch of different uh, metrics to do that. A natural idea is to consider gene body and promoter and count up all the interactions that originate from uh, this region. And then of course, we have to make sure that we make this number comparable with other um, uh, comparable across genes. One way to do that is to adjust these uh, gene 
you know, interactions that are in the gene body and promoter with a local background, perhaps estimated by regions of the same size in the upstream and downstream of the region. So a bulk version of this was actually, uh, uh, was actually mentioned in this paper. Um, and then uh, we could also do something more explicit, you know, adjust these for uh, GC content mobility and gene length. Uh, GC content and mobility are standard genomic biases. Uh, and then we said, uh, since we are looking at a population of cells with different cell types, maybe we can just, you know, use the average interaction of a cell across all the cells as its background. So if we have enough number of cells from different cell types, that would work well. So that basically comes down to standardizing, adjusting for the sequencing depth of the cells and then standardizing across uh, genes. So I'll show you how that performs. So this is the role without any adjustment. This is if we estimate the local background, this is the regression approach, and this is the standardization approach. So overall, it seemed to work quite well. So we decided to go with this standardization approach. And then next we asked whether this uh, single cell gene associating domain, you know, which captures interactions from gene bodies and promoters, is it a good proxy for gene expression? We, um, we, aggregated, uh, the we aggregated genes SEGAD scores across cells and then expression across genes and looked at the correlation of these. And we see pretty decent correlations that, you know, recapitulate the correlations that you would see in the gene activity scores from a TAC-seq and um, uh, single cell RNA-seq. And uh, furthermore, if we take marker genes defined from uh, single cell RNA-seq and aggregate the single cell gene associating uh, domain scores of uh, those marker genes, we can see that they actually have very nice cell type specificity. So this gave us more confidence that these SCGAD scores are actually good proxies for gene expression. Um, so I'll show one of these experiments. Then, then we took you know, uh, different single cell RNA seq data sets and high C data sets, uh, and then did this joint uh, integration. So we looked at a you know, similar system from the same lab, uh, a similar system from different labs. Uh, and then we also even looked at uh, a chip single cell chip seek, particularly K27 acetylation and K4 methylation. And we also looked at human pre -pre prefrontal uh, cortex. So I'll show you one of these in the interest of the time. So this is, um, so the data is coming from the same lab, but high C and RNA seq are profiled separately. And once we converted our high C, single cell high C, to gene level features, then we again our first step at this we use Surratt's canonical uh, correlations approach to do the joint integration. So this on the left hand side is the projection uh, of both single cell high C and RNA seq onto the same space. And it's a little bit easier if we color the cells uh, based on their source, whether they are single cell IC or RNA seq. And we see that they are nicely uh, mixed. Uh, the, the data sources are nicely mixed. And then we can look at single cell RNA seq separately and high C separately. And then we see that similar cell types are clustered together. And one thing is uh, why this, we found this quite interesting is that in the original publication, there were these group of cells just based on high C, they were labeled as neonatal neuron one, neonatal neuron two. So no more, you know, no further annotation was done on these. And once we project on this space, we actually can see that some of these are interneurons, you know, some of them are more like hippocampal pyramidal cells and so on. So there's definitely a lot of room in terms of improving the uh, annotation. So the rest are really similar. And just to point, we can do this with single cell uh, chip seek epigenome profiling too. We can do that very nicely. And uh, they're available. So just to recap this regulation theme, uh, single cell high C is just adding another data modality. Uh, the technology is still improving, uh, but uh, you know some of the most recent data sets and recent protocols are really pr uh, promising. Um, and uh, so we have observed that we can summarize single cell high Z uh, at the gene level as meaningful features. Uh, this enabled uh, you know integration with other data modalities, but we think there's actually a lot of room uh, 
for methods that do not necessarily do this type of uh, feature level uh, mapping before integration. So I'll stop there and I'll acknowledge. Uh, uh, so this is the work of uh, Sichi Shen from my group and Ye Zhang, uh, former member of my group. Ye is at Fred Hutch. Uh, she's been there for a while and you know dived into more single cell stuff. And if you guys are uh, hiring, if any of your departments are hiring, she's a real catch. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Sundas. Very nice talk. So I think following from Elizabeth's talk yesterday, I wonder if there are data where sales are measured for both high C and RNA seq. That I don't think we have yet, but we have high C and methylation. Mm. Um, I see. As far as I know, we don't have um, high C and RNA seq. I see. Yes, at least. Yeah. I see because I feel like probably your SCVI framework. It seems that which is what Elizabeth also used for her joint embedding yes. yesterday, right? Yeah. It could be something that's doable for the integration part. If we don't want to convert high C data to a one dimensional gene score, right? First. Yeah, yeah. So mm. uh, yeah, that definitely, I think there is room. So we have mm. efforts in that area, uh, but we don't have results yet. Mm. So we were just, you know, again, exploring the data, you know, is, is there a way to really reduce it to, gene level features. And, you know, we were happy to see that SCGAD seems mm. to be doing really well, but there's definitely room for improvement. Right. And I think another possible thing to do for high C data is to use the known enhancer notations, because if we mm -hmm. think the high C indicates yeah. enhancer promoter interactions. That's true, but probably yeah. we don't have that resolution Delusion. yet. Okay. So one of the best data sets, you can go to 10 KB resolution mm -hmm. and that I... might be okay. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, going to the truly the enhancer level, mm -hmm. we probably need to improve imputation methods mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, um, generate better quality data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's a quick question, I think. Uh, so when you do the pseudo-bulk to try to recapitulate uh, the bulk information, um, in the case of rare cells, which is the minimal number of cells you need to actually build uh, a believable map? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think hundreds are, I think, yeah, so hundreds are okay. It's just that if you have, other cell types in the thousands, they dominate. Uh, but otherwise, I think hundreds of cells, you know, few hundreds, they, they produce pretty decent contact maps. Thanks. So there's a comment on the over imputation mm -hmm. issue that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, for Hagashi. I think it's, you know, I think we can discuss more. But my opinion is that you have. I think if you just compare with the bulk high C, it may not be the right mm -hmm. way to evaluate that in a way that the bulk high C has to be enhanced also. Because mm -hmm. in single cell contact map, we try to enhance that and you see it, say, a contact and entry there. And in bulk, you may not see that, or you know, it's obscured because of some other issues. Mm -hmm. I think that's you know, we can discuss it. I, I think I think yeah. it's it's perhaps a research topic, like mm -hmm. how do you evaluate that by comparing to Oh, I see. A question is for the single cell GAD, right? GAD. I noticed that you apply to this um, DIPC, which is very, very, very high coverage. Mm -hmm. If you apply to a, you know, lower quality one, like the Joe Wacker's uh, previous data sets in human prefrontal cortex, what, it, what does that look like in terms of the separation of the cell types? I know that uh, our experiences with the DIPC, if you don't use any trick, you just use their, you know, single cell a B compromisation score, you can already mm -hmm. separate the cell types quite well. So that's a very good question. And I actually had a slide. So we have done some experiments to investigate that. So, you know, uh, keep your single cell RNA seq fixed and then vary the uh, single cell uh, high C data. So we varied the number of reads and also the, you know, number of genes features that we are using. So we can see that, and this is from Ecker's data, just focusing on major cell type performance 
drops if we if we focus on uh, you know uh, more sub cell types the pattern is the same but the overall numbers drop so we see that of course the you know number of reads uh, the has a, has the huge impact so is here these three major cell types are nicely separated and they start to mix uh, and then but this can you know just using changing the number of features you are using it actually helps to alleviate that drop and when we evaluated this with the you know transfer label accuracy where you uh, where you um, train a model based on single cell uh, rna seq and try to infer uh, cell labels for the single cell high c so the you know accuracy goes from 0.9 to 0.68 it's a drop but it's actually not that uh, dramatic And then we go from the right. Cindy, I wonder if you started thinking it's kind of like a next step after this, but if you started thinking about um, what you can learn biologically from single cell that you're missing in other data types, besides, you know, yeah. maybe slightly better clustering of cell types, for example, you know, if you look across genes, there's generally a correlation between your GAD score and uh, gene expression, but there's many genes that are not right on the diagonal. Mm -hmm. Are they certain functions, yeah. certain parts of the genome? Can we learn something that you wouldn't pick up either in bulk or that you wouldn't pick up with something like a tax seek, like just how open is the chromatin mm -hmm. on the gene body? Is there some information in this data? Do you think? I think so. I think we will learn more, um, more, I, I don't want to say sub cell types, but states probably, you know, cell states uh, where even though it's the same cell type if, in terms of the 3D chromatin structure, a subset of the cells would look different for, you know, a number of reasons. We haven't really dived deeply into that, but I think, you know, that's the kind of thing that we want to learn from single cell. Oh, cool. So you think there would be information that wouldn't be in single cell attack that would be really specific to genome folding? In single cell, single cell attack seek uh -huh. would tell you that the gene body is open or closed. Mm -hmm. um, your triangle is basically also measuring that. Yeah. But is there something more? Do you think like about than just measuring how yeah, open so is the chromatin I, on the I, gene? I think so, but I think we have to go beyond single cell GAD for that. I yeah. think you know we have to integrate, uh, maybe focus on more, uh, not just the integration as an aggregate score but uh, really pick up uh, what, uh, what enhancers should contribute, to a, a, should contribute a genes GAD score. Mm -hmm. I think that can tell us, uh, that can tell us more. Cool. Um, because from attack, it, it, it's hard to, um, from single cell attack, it's hard to identify these long range interactions. Just, you, yeah, just it's one dimensional. Association, you get something, but it's really hard. Yeah. So I think with this, instead of just getting an aggregate score, if we can tease out for a given gene, what long range interactions are actually associating with that gene, then, uh, then you know, that might provide an explanation for these uh, sub cell states. Cool, awesome. And just a quick comment to the Jessica's question, SNARE-seq, for example, does measure single cell RNA and HiC in the same cell type. And John, what else? There's some other technologies. Well, I've, I've mostly used SNARE-seq. Snare attack, I think. It doesn't do the both? Okay, I thought there was now a version that did high C, but maybe I'm wrong. Like a snare high C or something? There is imaging, right. So there is imaging, but yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Maybe that's the wrong name. It's like uh, from, maybe it is high car. Yeah. Thinking of the one that's, okay. Thinking of the one that does the, um, like the Psi high C that Vijay Ramani, like the first paper she cited from early ones. I think there's now a version of that where they take the cell pools and put them sequentially into different wells and put a series of barcodes that is unique enough to trace back to like the single cell. I thought there was a version, but maybe I'm wrong. It does RNA and high C. Okay, so maybe not yet. Okay. Yeah, not that I know of, but there is imaging and high C together. So there's some, you know, early works like 2000 data is some early work. Cool. Okay, thank you. Uh